we have endeavored in this course of lectures to rediscover, by means of spiritual science, what it is possible for this present time to recognize as an ancient wisdom in the splendid pictures of the old Greek mythology. And we have shown, to what a great extent, things which we recognize today in a different manner are taken for granted in this mythology. Ordinary conceptions of mythology, owing to their superficiality, must be seriously shaken when it is discovered that the profoundest and most significant principles of knowledge had already been expressed in it pictorially. More significant than all that is connected with what we might call the upper circle of the Greek gods, with Zeus, Jupiter, Poseidon, Neptune, Hades, Pluto, Apollo, Ares, Mars, was what the Greeks felt to be veiled in their mysteries in connection with the figure of Dionysus. For whereas everything connected with the upper gods was more or less embodied in the ideas of the external world, what related to the figure of Dionysus was hidden within the sanctity of their mysteries and was transmitted only to those persons who had gone through a thorough preparation. What then was the contradiction which the Greeks felt as existing between their conception of the upper gods and that which was embodied in the sanctity of the mysteries? In the conception of the upper gods, Zeus, Hades, Poseidon, Apollo, Ares, was embedded all that of which one can become conscious through a deeper insight into cosmic wonders, in quotes, into all that takes place around us and the laws that govern this. In that which was connected with the figure of Dionysus, on the other hand, there was embodied something essentially different, that, for instance, which pointed to the profoundest adventures of the human soul when striving after knowledge and the attainment of entry into the supersensible worlds. On all that befell the human soul when attaining knowledge and when living in the depths, on all the trials, tests which the human soul had to undergo along this path, light was thrown by those mysteries which were connected with the figure of Dionysus. And if we went, if we want to gain any understanding at all of the figure of Dionysus and of his relation to these trials of the soul, we shall have to enter somewhat into what can be said from the standpoint of the spiritual science of today concerning the human soul that is attaining to knowledge. It might seem that the man of today has more than sufficient opportunity for gaining knowledge concerning what the world really is. For we have a widely spread philosophy in every country, and it is expected of this philosophy that it should answer the question as to how knowledge comes into being. In the opinion of spiritual science, however, Philosophy is not as yet advanced so far as to be able to give an answer to the question as to how knowledge comes about, and you can easily see why this must be so. So long as the philosophy of the external world struggles against the recognition of the truth about man, that is, that he consists of physical body, etheric body, astral body, and ego, so long can this external philosophy never arrive at any exalted concepts. For knowledge is bound up with the collective nature of man's being, and the answer to the question about knowledge must give rise but to the empty phrases so indigenous to our present-day philosophy. If the true nature of man, that is his fourfold nature, is not taken into consideration, In this place, and owing to the limited time at our disposal, I can only hint at these things, and can speak from one particular side only, on the nature and the essence of human knowledge. We shall understand one another if, in the first place, we begin with the question, By what means does man gain knowledge for himself, no matter what the knowledge may signify? By what means do we acquire knowledge? Man could never acquire knowledge if he did not think, if in his soul he did not accomplish something like work by means of his ideas or thoughts. 
Knowledge does not come of itself. Man must work within himself. He must let ideas run their course in his soul if he wants to acquire knowledge. As students of spiritual science, we must ask ourselves, quote, where in human nature do those processes take place that we designate as the ideas which lead to knowledge? Close quote. The materialistic dream of knowledge, the philosophical fantasy of our day, thinks that knowledge comes into being through the fact that some sort of cerebral activity is accomplished. Certainly the brain does accomplish something in the process of cognition. But when we take into consideration that in cognition the principal thing is the inner work of the soul in the life of ideas, we must ask the question, quote, has this life of thought, as regards its content, please note I say, as regards its content, anything at all to do with the work that is accomplished in the brain, close quote. The brain is a part of the body, and everything that belongs to the content of the life of thought, everything that belongs to the knowledge-producing work of our soul, does not go as far as to the physical body, but is accomplished in the three higher members of the human entity, from the ego down through the astral body to the etheric body. In all the elements of the life of thought, you will find nothing at all, as regards the contents of these, that could go on in the external physical brain of its own accord. Thus, when we speak merely of the content of ideas, of the work of thought, we must locate it entirely in the three higher supersensible members of the human entity. And we may then ask, what has the brain to do with what takes place supersensibly in the human entity? There is, of course, the trivial fact to which the philosophers and psychologists of the day appeal that certain processes occur in the brain while we are cognizing. Certainly this commonplace truth is correct and cannot be denied. But nothing of the concept itself lives in the brain. What significance has the brain or the external bodily organization at all for cognition or for the life of ideas as such? I must be short, therefore I shall speak in symbols. The activity of the brain, as regards what happens in the soul, signifies exactly what the mirror signifies in which a man sees himself. When moving about with your personality you do not see yourself. But when you come before a mirror, you see what you are and what you look like. Anyone who maintains that the brain thinks, that the labor of thought goes on in the brain of its own accord, talks as reasonably as would a man who coming in front of a mirror should say, quote, I am not here, it is not I who walk, I must get inside into the mirror, it is there that I am, close quote he would very soon convince himself that he is not inside the mirror, that the mirror is but the cause, why that which is outside the mirror sees itself. And so it is with the whole physical organization. That which arises through the work of the brain is the supersensible activity of the three higher members of the human organism. In order that this may be perceived by the person himself, the mirror of the brain is necessary, so that, through the mirror of the brain, we perceive that which we are supersensibly. It is solely a result of the present human organization that this must be so. If, as an earthly being of today, man had not this reflecting bodily organ, his brain, he would certainly think his thoughts, but he would know nothing about them. All that is done by modern physiologists, and in part by psychologists as well, to recognize thought is just as clever as if a man sought for his real self in the looking glass. All that I have said here in a very few words can be completely substantiated by the theory of cognition and can be proved in a strictly scientific manner. It is another question whether one's words would be understood or not. Experiences today still speak to the contrary. One may explain these things ever so strictly, even to philosophers, 
yet they understand not a syllable of it, because they do not wish to enter into these things. I say emphatically, they do not wish to do it. For in these days, in the exoteric world, the will does not exist, really, to enter into the most serious questions regarding the human powers of knowledge. If we wish to express in correct diagrammatic form the process of human cognition, we must say, and there's a picture, taking this diagram as representing the external physical human organism, that in all this external bodily organism no process such as thinking or cognition exists, but it takes place in the adjoining etheric and astral bodies. In them are situated thoughts, which I here represent diagrammatically by these circles. These thoughts do not enter into the brain. To think so would be utter folly. But through the activity of the brain they are reflected and thrown back again into the etheric body, astral body and ego. And these reflections which we create ourselves and which become visible to us through the brain are seen by us when, as earthly men, we become aware of what we are really doing in our psychic life. Within the brain nothing at all exists of the nature of thought. There is just as little thought within the brain as there is something of yourself behind the mirror when you see yourself reflected in it. The mirror in which we see ourselves reflected is simple, but the brain is an immensely complicated reflector and a complicated activity has to take place in order that it can be the instrument not only wherewith to create our thoughts, but to reflect them. In other words, before a thought can come into being for an inhabitant of this earth, preparation must be made. We know that this preparation took place through the periods of ancient Saturn, Sun and Moon and that the present-day physical body of man, and also his brain, is the result of many spiritual hierarchies. So that we may say, with the beginning of earthly evolution, man was so constituted that he could develop his physical brain, and also that this could become the reflecting apparatus for that which man really is, and for what is present in the surroundings of his physical organism. It is thus we speak today, and this can already be understood by an anthroposophical gathering such as this. As a matter of fact, this process of perception is quite easy of comprehension. What we are able to understand in this way today was perceived and felt by the ancient Greek, and for that reason he said to himself, Here in this physical bodily organism, without a man's being directly conscious of it, something of immense significance is hidden. This physical bodily organism is indeed derived from the earth, for it consists of the materials and forces of the earth. But there is something secreted within it that is capable of reflecting the whole life of the human soul. That which, coming from the earth, that is macrocosmically, participates in the construction of the brain was called by the ancient Greek when he directed his feelings to the microcosm, to man, the Dionysian principle. So that within us Dionysus is active in order to make of our bodily organism a mirror for our intellectual, spiritual life. Now, we can experience this principle when, to this purely theoretical explanation, we add the first and easiest soul test because it is the easiest soul test and because man is not organized at the present day in the very finest manner, he generally passes it by. These tests must must be less fine if the man of today is to perceive them. It is only when one is filled with a certain enthusiasm for knowledge, when one regards knowledge as a matter of life itself, that one feels that what is about to be said is indeed like a first, in quotes, proving of the soul. This enthusiasm comes when, out of such knowledge, one feels constrained to say something like the following. From primeval times there resounds for us the mighty words of wisdom, Man, know thyself. 
self-knowledge, as the climax of all other true knowledge, shines as a high ideal before us. That is, seeing we desire to acquire knowledge generally, we strive first to attain to a knowledge of ourselves. Now all our knowledge runs its course in a life of thought and conceptions. This life of conceptions which is present to us, and which also reflects all external objects, we experience as a reflection. It does not, in the least, enter into that which we are as a physical bodily organism. It is thrown back from us. And just as little as a person can see what is behind the mirror, so little can he see into his physical being. It also does not enter his physical organism because his psychic life is completely filled by a life of imagery. One is forced to say, quote, It is then impossible to get to know oneself. One can only become acquainted with one's conceptual life, which has made one into a reflecting apparatus. Close quote. It is impossible for us to enter there. We can only come to the boundary. For there the whole psychic life is thrown back, just as in a mirror we see thrown back the reflection of a man. If an undefined feeling exhorts us to know ourselves, then we must admit that we cannot know ourselves at all, for it is impossible for us to do so. What I have said now is for most people at the present day an abstraction, because they have no enthusiasm for knowledge because they cannot develop the passion which must be there when the soul is confronted with the need for that which it really must have. Now picture to yourselves all this developed as feeling. Then your soul is faced with a severe ordeal vis-à-vis, quote, you must attain something to which you can by no means attain, close quote. Anthroposophically expressed, it would run thus, quote, All external knowledge, everything that a man can acquire exoterically, leads to no self-cognition whatsoever. From this the endeavor arose to push forward by quite another road than that of ordinary knowledge to that which is the work of Dionysus within us, to our own true being. This took place in the Mysteries. In other words, in the mysteries, something was transmitted to men which had nothing to do with the ordinary life of the soul, which is only reflected in our bodily organism. The mysteries did not limit man to exoteric knowledge, for by that means they could never have led him into himself. Anyone wishing to devote himself to merely external or exoteric knowledge would, as a logical consequence, say, quote, The mysteries must have been a humbug, for they have meaning only when efforts are made to attain something quite other than external knowledge in order to arrive at Dionysus. Therefore, in the mysteries, we have to look for certain happenings, which approach men quite differently from all that approaches them outwardly in exoteric life. Hence we are directly confronted with the question, quote, Is there any possible means of entering into that which otherwise is only a reflecting apparatus? Close quote. I should like to begin in the first place with the smallest thing. When the very first step is taken in the representation of higher spiritual truths, truths which belong to reality and not to illusion, one's procedure is quite different from what it is when representing life according to external science, or in any other way. This also is the reason why it is so difficult to make oneself understood. Nowadays people try to bind everything with the fetters made to suit external science, and that which does not agree with these is not considered scientific. But with such knowledge it is not possible to penetrate into the nature of things. Hence you see that in the lectures that have been held here on the subject of spiritual science, another mode of presentation is used than that employed in ordinary science. Things are so described that light is thrown on them from different sides, 
Also, language is in a certain way taken more seriously. And when language is taken seriously, we arrive at something that might be called the, in quotes, genius of language. Some day there will be a science of language which will not be so dry and insipid as that of the present day, because it will treat of the living genius of language, which even in these days still underlies the conscious conceptual life of the ego man of today. Many a thing must be brought forth by this genius of speech if the things of the spiritual world that lie behind what is grasped by ordinary consciousness are to be understood. Hence the unfamiliarity of many of the descriptions of the higher worlds that are bound to arise. At the very outset, when we begin to speak of the things of the spiritual world, we come to something that must pass behind what a man has in his consciousness. It must be brought out of the subconscious strata of the soul. Therefore, if one wishes at the present day to describe matters of spiritual science in their true sense, something is necessary which may seem to you trivial, but is all the same important. One must forego the ordinary means of linguistic expression. Perhaps people will go so far as to say, if you forego these means of ordinary expression, professors and other clever folk will say you are a man who does not know how to employ language correctly. They will find all manner of fault with you. They will consider your mode of expression unclear. They will carp in all sorts of ways at the mode in which spiritual science is expressed. The fact that this has to be so must be consciously accepted. One must look the fact straight in the face, that one may perhaps be considered stupid, because one avoids employing the ordinary mode of expression, the so-called logically perfect, which, taken in a higher connection, is logically speaking eminently imperfect. What I have pointed out to you as a small but not an unimportant matter was a necessity for the pupil of the mysteries in the Greek age, and is still so for the mystery pupil of today. In order to come to his full self, in order to dive down into his own inner being, which otherwise is only reflected in the organism of his body, the pupil of the mysteries must renounce the ordinary external methods of knowledge. Superficial people might say to this, quote, Yet you demand that a person should always maintain his sound human understanding, and that he should judge everything connected with the higher worlds by this means. Now you say that a man must lay aside the ordinary, externally conscious type of knowledge. Close quote. That is an apparent contradiction. In truth, it is possible, thoroughly possible, to test the things of the higher world with one's sound human understanding and yet to abstain from the external form of conscious knowledge which we are accustomed to employ. Here again we are faced with a severe trial, or probation of the soul. Wherein does this probation consist? As modern life is constituted, the soul is accustomed to think and to employ the healthy human understanding in those forms in which in ordinary conceptual life it is trained by the external world. And now let us picture a professor or some learned person who is exceptionally skilled at thinking in accordance with the forms of external science. People may come and say, quote, Will you now make something clear to this professor who is quite capable of thinking scientifically in the present-day sense of the word? Close quote. We in no way wish to deny that this professor has a sound human understanding for the ordinary things of the external world, but what we have to speak about are the things of the spiritual world, and he must not listen with that portion of his soul which the human understanding uses for the ordinary things of the external world, but with a completely different portion of his soul. We do not say that the healthy human understanding must be followed when it is desired to grasp other things than those belonging to the external world, for which we have indeed our sound human understanding. One can have this for the ordinary things of the external world, yet be completely forsaken by it 
as regards the things that belong to the spiritual world. What is necessary when we seek to penetrate into the spiritual worlds is not criticism of the things appertaining to spiritual science by means of a healthy human understanding, but that we carry our sound human understanding along with us, that we do not lose it on the way from external science to the inner science of the spirit. It is important that the soul should be strong enough not to experience the fate that overtakes so very many persons today, and which may be described thus. When persons who are truly masters of logic in matters relating to external science hear about spiritual science, they have to take the path described to you that leads from external things to things appertaining to the spiritual world. But along this path they generally lose their healthy human understanding, and they imagine, because they had it at the start, they still have it later on. It would be a serious delusion were one to think that consequently one could not possibly penetrate to the things of the spiritual world with a healthy human understanding, only it must not be lost by the way. What I have now set before you in a trivial way was necessary in a much higher sense for the Greek mystics, and it is necessary also for the mystics of today. They have to lay aside all that belongs to ordinary consciousness. Still, out of this ordinary consciousness, they have to take with them the healthy human understanding, and then, by means of the instrument of this healthy human understanding, judge things from quite another point of view. Without this renunciation of ordinary consciousness, there can be no mystic. He must forego that which is serviceable in the ordinary external world. The probation of the soul, which already makes its appearance here, consists in this, that along this path which leads from the ordinary things of the external world to the world of the spirit, the healthy human understanding is not lost, that these things are not held to be nonsense which emerge as something more profound when grasped by the healthy human understanding that has been retained. Thus it was also necessary for the Greek mystics to lay aside everything that could be experienced in the outer exoteric world and to enter on a quite different condition of soul, and this is indeed necessary also for the mystics of today. Hence the things of the external world, when they enter into the region of mysticism, assume sometimes quite different names and there is deep significance in the Rosicrucian drama, the soul's probation, where it is said of Benedictus that he so changed the names of many things that when he spoke of them they took on quite an opposite meaning. What Capacius calls unhappiness, Benedictus calls happiness. Just as after death our life is at first run through in reverse order, and we experience things backward, so must the names of things be changed almost into their opposite when we speak according to the true meaning of the higher worlds. Hence you can estimate what a completely different world it was which the ancient Greeks recognized as the content of their holy mysteries. Within these mysteries, and according to the sense of the mysteries, what did Dionysus stand for? If you read my little book titled Spiritual Guidance of Man, you will see that in all ages there have been great teachers of humanity who remained invisible except to clairvoyant consciousness. It was true the ancient Egyptians, replying to the Greeks who asked them who their teacher was, said that they had been taught by the gods. What they meant was that clairvoyant people were inspired by teachers who did not come down to earth but remained in etheric space and taught them. I am telling you no dream, no fantasy, but something entirely in accordance with the truth. When the mystics of ancient Greece, who were inducted into the mysteries, had gone through the correct preparation, so that they did not feel things in a superficial or frivolous way, and were admitted to the holy mysteries, they saw things differently from the way in which the ordinary consciousness sees them. They were then in a position to see the teacher within the mysteries, 
he who cannot be seen with the physical eyes, but is visible only to the inspired consciousness. The physical hierophants of the mysteries, who could be seen with physical eyes, were not the most important persons. The important ones were those who were visible to clairvoyant consciousness, and in the mysteries with which we are most concerned, the Dionysian mysteries, the greatest teacher of those mystics among the ancient Greeks who had been sufficiently prepared was actually the younger Dionysus himself. That figure of whom I have already said that he was an actual person, and who with Sininus and a train of fauns had taken the journey from Europe to Asia and back. This figure was also the true teacher of the mystics of the Dionysian mysteries. Dionysus appeared as an etheric form in these holy mysteries, and in connection with him things could now be perceived which were beheld not merely as reflections by means of ordinary consciousness, but which sprang forth directly out of the inner nature of Dionysus. Because Dionysus is in our own selves, each person saw himself in Dionysus and learned to know himself, not through a kind of inner brooding as is so often recommended today in ignorance of the true facts. For the Greek mystic, the way to self-knowledge was precisely that of getting out of himself. The way was not to brood inwardly, merely contemplating the reflections of the ordinary life of the soul, but to look upon that which they themselves were, when absorbed in the being of the great teacher. This great teacher, who was not visible when the disciple entered the mysteries, the mystic saw as his own being. Outside in the world, where exoteric persons did not know him as Dionysus, he incarnated in the flesh, made the journey from Europe to Asia and back again, and was an actual human being standing on the physical plane. In the mysteries he appeared in his spiritual form, which was, however, similar to the real human bodily form seen by us today as the bodily form of the ego. An essential point which we must carefully keep in mind is this, that outside in the world Dionysus went on his journeys as a man, incarnated in the flesh. In the mysteries, however, in order to train the mystics to higher consciousness, Dionysus appeared in his spiritual form. In a certain way, it is the same today. When the present-day leaders of humanity go about the world in their human dress, they are not recognized by what they are in the exoteric world. When, from the theosophical standpoint, we speak of the masters of wisdom and of the harmony of perceptions, people would often be surprised to see in what simple, unpretentious human form these masters of wisdom and harmony of perceptions pass through all countries. They are present on the physical plane, but do not give their most important teachings there, but after the pattern of Dionysus they impart them on the spiritual plane. Those who wish to hear them in order to receive their teachings must have access to them not only in their physical body of flesh, but in their spiritual form. In a certain sense it is the same today as in the old Dionysian mysticism. It is one of the trials of the soul that we should have to carry out the saying, Know thyself, by in a certain sense going out of ourselves. But there was yet another test or trial of the soul connected with the Dionysian mysteries. The mystics, as I have said, came to, know, came to know Dionysus as a spiritual form. They were indeed taught by him in the mysteries. They learned to recognize him as a spiritual form, which was entirely controlled by the most important, the most essential part of a man's own nature, represented by the human self as it stands firmly planted on the earth. When the Greek mystics directed their clairvoyant gaze to this figure of Dionysus, he appeared to them as a beautiful and dignified form which outwardly represented man in a glorious manner. But when the mystic left the mystery place, Dionysus would not appear so beautiful. I have expressly stated that Dionysus was still a spiritual teacher when the actual person Dionysus, who made the journey from Europe to Asia and back again, was already dead. 
The younger Dionysus remained for a long time after this as teacher in the mysteries, just as he who stands within the mysteries today must not hope to see the same form of sublime beauty on the physical plane as he sees in glorious beauty in the spiritual world. So he must realize that the physical embodiment of the form encountered in the mysteries is in many ways an illusion and veils the sublime beauty of the spirit form, making it often seem ugly, and so it was in the case of Dionysus. What tradition has handed down to us as the external likeness of Dionysus, who is not represented as having so perfect a form as Zeus, is actually the picture of the external, physically incarnated Dionysus. The Dionysus of the Mysteries was a beautiful being. The external Dionysus, incarnated in the flesh, is not to be compared with him. Hence we must not look for the form of Dionysus in olden times among the finest types of human beauty, neither is he so represented in legend. And those who belong to the train of Dionysus were in a certain way like satyrs and silenus with externally hideous human forms. In fact, we find many things that are in the highest degree remarkable in Greek mythology. We are told, among other things, and it is true, that the teacher of Dionysus was a very ugly man. The man who was the teacher of Dionysus himself, so the Dionysian mysteries tell us, was Silenos. Silenus or Silenos was the teacher of Dionysus, and he is depicted as a very wise individual. We only need recall that a great number of wise sayings were attributed to Silenus, which points out, for the most part, how worthless the ordinary life of man must be considered when taken only in its external aspect, in its aspect of maya, of illusion. In one saying, which made a great impression on Nietzsche, we are told that when King Midas asked Silenus, the teacher of Dionysus, what was best for men, Silenus replied with that significant but abstruse saying, O oh, you race of a day, it were best for you not to have been born, or since you already have been born, the next best thing is that you should soon die. Close quote. This saying must be rightly understood. It refers to the connection between the spiritual reality of the supersensible world and external maya, the great illusion or deception. Thus, when considered as physical human forms, there were very few among these exalted beings who are possessed of any external, external beauty. In one way we may still idealize Dionysus when we contrast him with what he was as external man. If we compare the form which Dionysus had as a physical being with that in which he appeared in sublime beauty in the mysteries, we may still do so. We need not picture him as ugly. But we should make a mistake if we were to picture the teacher and master of this Dionysus, old Silenus, as otherwise then with an ugly snub nose and pointed ears and not in the least handsome. This Silenus this teacher of Dionysus, who is to transmit to man the last remnant of the primeval wisdom adapted to the human ego consciousness, a wisdom which came forth out of a deeper self of man, was more nearly related to that form beyond which, as regards its more essential features, man's present bodily form has long since passed. The ancient Greek imagined that man in his present beauty as regards his external maya had sprung from an ancient hideous human form and that the type of that individuality was embodied in Silenus, the teacher of Dionysus, who was far from handsome. Now, picture to yourselves, and this should not be difficult for you as anthroposophists, that in Dionysus the younger, as in his teacher the wise Silenus, we have individualities who, in accordance with all that I have told you, were infinitely important to the training of the present ego-consciousness. Those individualities existed in prehistoric days into which no history can look, but about which we are told in Greek epics and myths. In those times both Silenus the Wise and also Dionysus were incarnated in physical bodies, performed external physical acts, and died 
seeing that their bodies had to die. The individualities, however, persisted. In the course of human progress, as we know, many a thing took place, which, for those who form only abstract ideas, is quite astounding, especially in regard to the incarnations of human or otherwise constituted beings. To ordinary perception, a later incarnation, despite its being one that is further advanced, frequently appears perhaps less perfect than an earlier one. I gave but a slight idea of this, drawn from spiritual realities, in my second Rosicrucian drama, where I told of the incarnations of the monk of the Middle Ages and of Maria in more modern times. In history also the anthroposophist, if he thinks abstractly, has often to overcome much astonishment when considering two successive, or at least two related, incarnations. The younger Dionysus, who, as I have told you, permitted the essence of his soul to flow into external civilization, was yet able to gather it together again at a certain time, as soul, in a single body, and reincarnated among men. He did not retain his old form, however, but added to his external physical form something of that which composed his spiritual body in the mysteries. The younger Dionysus was born again in historical times in a human body as also his teacher, the wise Silenus. And the mysticism of ancient Greece was clearly conscious of the fact that these forms should be born again. The artists of ancient Greece, who were stimulated and inspired by mystics, were also fully conscious of this. Silenus, the wise teacher of Dionysus, was born again, and in his reincarnation he was none other than Socrates. Socrates is the reincarnated Silenus, the reincarnated teacher of Dionysus. The reincarnated Dionysus, that being in whom the soul of the aforetime Dionysus lived, was Plato. One first notes the deeper sense of Greek history when one enters into that which was not forsooth known to those who handed down the external history of Greece, but was known to the mystics and was passed on from generation to generation up to the present time, and which is also to be found in the Akashic records. Spiritual science is able to proclaim once more that in bygone ages Greece supplied teachers for humanity and sent them to Asia in the expedition led by Dionysus, whose teacher was the wise Silenus and that, in a way adapted to a later age, everything that Dionysus and the wise Silenus had been able to do for ancient Greece was done anew by Socrates and Plato. Precisely at the time when the mysteries were falling into decay, when there were no longer mystics who could see the younger Dionysus clairvoyantly in the holy mysteries, this same younger Dionysus appeared in the form of Plato as the second great teacher of Greece, as the true descendant of Dionysus. Silenus the wise appeared also in the form of Socrates. We first recognize the meaning of the spiritual culture of ancient Greece in the true sense of Grecian mysticism, when we know that the ancient Dionysian civilization had its resurrection in Plato, and we admire Platonism in quite another sense. We see it in its true form, when we know that in Plato dwelt the soul of the younger Dionysus. <laughs>